doors are locked anyway now, you can't get out of here. <laughs> um, the goal for today really is to raise awareness about how important working dogs are uh, for multiple reasons. The first one is what's their societal roles, and you know we'll see that they are in places we don't expect them to be. Also in disasters, how do we approach those animals? Because they will be part of the response for various reasons, and also for those of us who provide care to those animals, how do we approach those guys, whether it's in the field or in our hospitals, or you may also be in a shelter situation following a disaster, and so you should know how to approach those animals. So we'll start with a little game, and we're very lucky today we have uh, Louise from Covaria Canine, who is, uh, I'll let you guys look it up afterward, but we do a lot of great things. She knows every canine handler in California, so she can't play the game. Um, I want you guys to just tell me, in terms of working dogs, so I'm talking law enforcement and social and rescue, what jobs are out there for working dogs? So patrol, so catching and biting bad guys, looking for drugs. What else? Arson. Sorry? Arson. Bombs. Narcotics. Narcotics. Cadaver, Cadaver. What else is out there? Bed bugs. Bed bugs. <laughs> I didn't know that one, but. <laughs> I didn't know that one either. Even I'm learning myself, you see, so that's great. What else is out there? There's much more. Anybody went from uh, through um, San Francisco airport? Little beagles? Yeah, customs. They are sniffing your luggage, looking for apples or whatever, vegetables, you know. Or Australia is quite serious as well about that. When you get there, they have a lot of very happy dogs, you know, uh, that will come and uh, sniff your luggage. Um, Coast guards? They have canines as well. They have their own uh, page. If you look them up online, they have cool Google goggles to jump out of helicopters and such. Um, you have, uh, so cadavers have been mentioned, also looking for live people. You have dogs that smell money. So if you're looking into uh, some kind of drug operation and there's money stashed, there are dogs that actually are trained to smell uh, money. There are dogs that are trained to smell um, shell from um, firearms. So if you have a crime scene, someone shoots a gun, there are dogs that will come and look specifically for um, those shells. Uh, and tons of other examples, obviously. And if you think also about various agencies, right, so we have obviously sheriffs, police departments, but like I mentioned, Coast Guards, the military. Um, Louise was telling me recently that uh, U.S. Mint in San Francisco has two canines. Uh, and there are uh, bomb, dog, bomb dogs, and some of them have multiple jobs. Um, the U.S. Forestry Services have, one, have, have dogs, um, the Abilene FBI. Detection. Sorry? Abilene detection. Abilene detection. I told you she can't play the game because she knows them all. <laughs> so I'm assuming this is like a um, fish and, it's like fish and wildlife. Uh, and so they are everywhere, okay? Uh, and each of them has one or more than one job, so we have to factor that in as well. And just by mentioning those, you can see how important they are in our society. And so, you know, if I'm taking care of the beagle at SFO that's supposed to smell things and somehow, you know, that dog can't show up to work that day, that might be the day where a new pest is introduced into the U.S. Uh, if I'm taking care of a patrol dog while the president is coming to give a speech in Sacramento and that dog doesn't show up and the bomb there goes off, that's a problem as well. So those dogs have a job that is quite serious. All right, so that being said, um, in terms of incidents involving animals, and I think that talking to this crowd, I think there's no better crowd than you guys to say that, uh, those are extremely rarely planned, right? And so uh, there are some operations, like for instance, if um, the ASPCA is busting out a uh, fighting ring, or if you have a case of um, animals that are not treated well, there is some planning that comes ahead of time, but if you have a major disaster, and obviously being in Sonoma, we all think about the, the fires, there's no planning that when it happens, it happens. It's very chaotic, 
no matter how much you plan, there will always be chaos. And thankfully, we're here today to help planning. And I think that, again, you guys know what planning means. I'm speaking to the wrong people, if anything, talking about planning, because you guys are planners by definition. But you also know that going in, you will expect some kind of chaos at some point. Um, it's emotionally charged. I won't even bring it up here because if I were anywhere else, I would give examples, but I think here in Sonoma, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. And those situations are potentially or even clearly dangerous. And again, I, I won't discuss that too much here with you guys. And as first responders, usually I think that all the jobs we do, no matter what they are, always boil down to two things, securing the scene and providing medical care. Uh, and obviously, usually we're talking about providing medical care to humans first, uh, but obviously animals are a big part of the puzzle as well. Not only because usually almost everyone likes animals, uh, but also because we understand the emotional values they have for their owners, but also when we think about working dogs and so forth, the societal value as well. So in terms of things that I think that as first responders we need to be able to provide quite readily, uh, oxygen is one thing that comes to mind quite uh, easily because it's something that's easy to implement. Many animals will benefit from that. I am a small animal veterinarian, so I stay away from anything bigger than me. So <laughs> you won't gain much knowledge from me in terms of horses and so forth. But um, we'll talk mostly about dogs and cats. And uh, you know, transporting animals is also a problem. You have to think about how you're going to do it. And also potentially tailoring transport based on the animal's condition. Uh, if you're, the patient you're transporting, for instance, is aggressive, or if you have a patient with a back fracture that's suspected or something like this. And CPR is another thing that I think if we're going to provide medical care out there, that's one of the things that we should be able to provide. Uh, and I'll talk more about it during the training because CPR outside of a veterinary hospital is not uncommonly futile, but I think that the, the reasons to do it are twofold. The first one is, you know, if someone just lost everything, um, at least seeing that you try to help their pet, it really helps with coping with the recent loss of a pet. So even if deep inside you know that this situation is not going anywhere, I think doing it with a professional background uh, adds to uh, the coping mechanism. And the other thing is going back to the working dogs. Uh, if you have, if you are first responders and you're called somewhere to provide care, uh, the canine handler will expect you to provide the best care possible to his partner uh, or her partner. And that means that going to the extreme and you know just providing the same level of care as if this patient were a human. And so I think that's why it's important to know what we're doing when we approach those patients. And again, I think that I'm talking to the wrong crowd here, um, is and no matter how much you plan, we always ask ourselves, how can this go wrong? You know, what if the horse starts panicking? What if the rope breaks? Always asking ourselves, what if this go wrong? And I have this picture here, and unfortunately, some of you guys were at the Bada conference, so you may have heard the story, but for those of you who weren't there, I have the picture of this chimpanzee here because um, one of my good friends is a firefighter in Paris, and um, it's a very special unit there because it's a military uh, unit that does firefighting in Paris. So all the firefighters in the city of Paris are military personnel that do civilian um, firefighting. And one of the other sp uh, specificities, they have two vets on staff 24-7 uh, that mostly do paperwork but get called that when there is either uh, their dogs, because they have such and rescue dogs as well, that are uh, deployed, or if there is anything with an animal. And once he was called in because um, someone's pet chimpanzee was walking down the street in Paris. And the lady was saying that her chimpanzee was very, very friendly and that it should not be a big deal to get the chimp back. Um, for those of you who don't know much about chimpanzees, there's two species on Earth that actually go to war, humans, obviously, uh, and chimpanzees, meaning they actually will gather buddies and they will go and attack another crew of buddies um, to take whatever they have there, being food or other things. And 
you, should, you can look it up online, but when I say they go to war, they will actually mutilate dead bodies from the other clan. So they are pretty, pretty bad animals. And so now you have this thing that's bigger than me in the street of Paris that can climb on trees, run fast, take your head off of you. Um, and so the first question is, how can this go wrong? And so the lady is saying that her chimp is very friendly, but you have to ask yourself, you know, what can happen? And so you have to plan ahead. And so same thing, I think, with horses, you always, or cows, you ask yourself, you know, how can this go wrong? You know, if you're looking at a goat or a sheep, it can go wrong, right? You know, if they escape their pen, they can get on the road and so forth. You're unlikely to be attacked by a goat, but it's possible if it's a ram. Um, if it's a dog, what can go wrong? If it's a cat, cats are very, very, very bad animals. They are very <laughs> small, but they are the worst. They are the worst. <laughs> so, and again, I'm talking to the wrong crowd here because I'm sure you guys already go through this when you think about rescues. We'll talk a little bit about working dogs and what is so specific about them compared to pet dogs uh, that we may encounter as well. So the only really scientific reports out there are about 9-11. Okay, so this is a picture that was taken uh, at ground zero. And if you look at this, this is the first responder disaster. There is physical danger in terms of potential fire, toxins, fumes, dust, cutting things, um, water seeping, contamination if you have sewers coming up. So this is a big, big problem. And now as a veterinarian, I look at this and we're sending dogs in there as well. There were 50,000 rescue workers and actually 300 search and rescue dogs. So when I saw this number, it actually was much more than I found, but obviously it was a big uh, response that required that many dogs. And there was one study that was uh, published down here. Uh, they surveyed all the dogs that they could reach. 96 responded, 59 were from FEMA, 10 dogs and uh, 10 police dogs and 27 search and rescue. So you can see that already there are different jobs there, right? We're gonna have patrol dogs, we're gonna have um, bomb dogs potentially and search and rescue dogs were a big part of the response. And the question was, what happened to those dogs? And we care about this because The reason why we do this is because we need to know, okay, this happened, but what happened to the dog so that next time something of this scale happens, we can prepare ourselves to actually care for them. And so what we found is that dogs are very resilient. We knew that already. We had some vomiting, diarrhea issues, some cuts and abrasions. Obviously, when you uh, walk on all those um, um, broken um, materials, Dogs were tired, change in appetite, dehydration, it's a big thing, you know, they are working out there, it's hot, and they may not have um, access to water, and you know, working dogs, they're the one working in there, and they are hard workers, and so usually, um, unless the handlers tell them to stop, they will not stop working, that's their passion, it's working. I wish I had that passion. Um, Respiratory tract problems because they are smelling fumes and dust and all those are potentially toxic as well. Heat exhaustion, orthopedic or back problems, just like us, you know, their uh, work in there is very physical. They are jumping, going up and down and, you know, going through crevices and so forth. And so that creates problems as well. The other thing is uh, looking in the emergency room at the University of Pennsylvania. So it's a very urban area. Uh, where the, the crime, I spent a year there, uh, and uh, I think that, I feel like I was working on a TV show because the things I saw in the emergency room on the veterinary side could have been on TV. Gunshots, stab wounds, and uh, you know, you see good dogs, bad dogs, uh, you have the, um, you know, 2 a.m. pit bull that someone walked into the house and stabbed the pit bull and walked away, which is definitely not what happened, I suppose, but, um, they, you, you'll see just crazy trauma there. And so what they did is they looked at German Shepherd, oops, go back. Uh, they looked at German Shepherds, and, which is a very common breed on the police side, obviously. Uh, there were 138 um, visits by 74 dogs, and then they had civilian German Shepherds. 
and the most common presenting complaint was gastrointestinal disease, vomiting, diarrhea, and gastric dilation volvulus, also called bloat uh, in working dogs. And both military and civilian law enforcement, I would say that bloat is one of the top concerns at the moment for many reasons, and we'll talk about this later. And in the police dog, there was a little more often orthopedic diseases because again, those guys' lifestyle make it that they have to jump over fences and run after bad guys and so forth. And so again, this is interesting because this tells us what is going on with those dogs. We can actually implement preventative measures and training measures to actually minimize uh, the uh, uh, incidence of those problems. I looked uh, um, at our data at the University of, Can of uh, California to see what police dogs we saw and what happened to them. And so between 2010 and 2012, we saw 27 uh, dogs. It's not a lot, and I think it's also because usually police departments have very well established relationship with local veterinarian, and UC Davis is more of a referral center, so we tend to see the ones that uh, are referred for specific procedures. Uh, and in Philadelphia, for instance, it's a more urban hospital, so usually if something happens to a canine, they just drive straight there. Mean expense was $2,800. So depending on where you come from, that's not a lot or that's a lot. Uh, yes? That's per dog over that period of time, yeah. Correct, yeah. Yeah, but usually many of them come for a visit or two, but again, it's a referral center, so they tend to be referred for specific procedures. But, um, and I've worked in other hospitals in, across the country, so I've seen a good sample of uh, uh, police dogs. And you have, anyone from CHP here? No, no, no. Uh, CHP, when you talk to them, just do whatever you need to do. They have the money, apparently. Uh, I've seen dogs from very small town USA where the handler tells me, usually they're crying by then, I call my boss and my boss told me that this is my dog now. And uh, unfortunately, police officers don't make as much money as we all wish they would. So now we have a very sick dog that's extremely bonded with the owner and, the o and you're presenting the owner with a $5,000 estimate and this is not this guy's dog, it's his partner. And so it's very hard because it also means that we have at the level of the community, we have to take care of our working dogs because we understand their values. And so what's important is to do fundraising ahead of time uh, because people in our community understand the value of working dogs. And so guaranteed, no matter where you live, you will find money for your local working dog. It will take time, you know, go find me and so forth. But the issue is when it's two in the morning and I'm in the hospital with a dog that just got, just got stabbed, we can't do a go find me at that time. So you have to think about this ahead of time. So in your community, do those fundraisers ahead of time and put it in, you know, a little piggy bank, a little doggy bank, I guess, <laughs> uh, for the dog. An example, uh, when I was at Illinois, um, they have a huge problem there with uh, narcotics. And uh, I saw one of their canine and um, we talked about the bill, unfortunately. And the guy was very chill about it because he was telling me that the way they function is any drug bust that yields money, somehow where they really find cash and so forth, they, some money goes into the canine fund. And so whatever money the dog brings in, goes into the piggy bank and they can use that um, for their dogs. And so thankfully, <laughs> they have a lot of drug problems. And so when something happens to their dogs, they can tap into that little uh, doggy bank. And so very, very important to think about this ahead of time. And here I just plotted uh, the different dogs, so 27 of them over time. And you can see that most dogs are at some level that's decent. And then when you start hitting 5,000, it starts becoming obviously a lot of money for most people. And we have to think about this ahead of time because again, this does not happen Monday morning at 10 a.m. when everyone is here. This happens at 2 a.m. on a Sunday night and there's no one that can approve expenses on the phone and so forth. So we have to think about this ahead of time. Uh, that being said, 
most veterinary practices will be very willing to work with you for a working dog um, until we can find a solution. The one on the left here um, is pretty much the reason why I'm here today. And this was during my residency. When you train as a vet, there's patients you will always remember. And this dog is really the dog that started my passion for working dogs. Um, it was a dog that was a patrol police dog that contracted leptospirosis. So it's a big problem in California in the spring in particular. Uh, it's an infection that will shut down your liver and kidney. And that dog required dialysis. And unfortunately, the outcome was bad, uh, despite this bill, unfortunately. Uh, and um, I was just stunned by the support system for that dog. Um, most hospitals, again, if you bring your dog to a vet hospital, chances are we'll tell you, okay, we'll take your dog from you and you can visit in the morning and in the evening, you can come in the back and so forth. Uh, for working dogs, we tend to be much more accommodating for two reasons. The first one is our safety. This was a patrol dog and he was not the kind that we could handle without the handler. So we definitely needed the guy there, but also because we realized that this is not a dog. This is a police officer. And when you talk to the guy, that dog saved his life more than one. So it's inhuman to tell them that, oh, you can only come twice a day and that's it for 10 minutes. So, you know, the guy was there all the time and the dog was with us I think for 10 days almost in the hospital and there was not a single minute in those 10 days where there was not a police officer in the building. You know, if the handler could not be there, his buddies were there. Um, and <clears throat> unfortunately he passed away and the fundraiser that came afterward brought a lot of money, not a lot, but more than the bill and so uh, we donated that money to our dialysis unit and a year later the guy came back to give a speech when the unit opened and you know again the guy's tall big guy is a cop he walks to the podium has a little speech written says two words and starts crying like i've never seen anyone cry could not finish reading the speech so one of his buddy had to finish the speech for him so uh, again i witnessed all this and that to me really sealed the deal as to how important those animals are. Now, the other question is what happens to those guys, right? They come to a hospital, but are they coming because they have vaccines? Or are they coming because they have teeth problem? Uh, and so DOSS here stands for dental and uh, oral surgery service. So most dogs come to see the dentist because they are patrol dogs, the ones that we see. And so every time someone asks me, hey, can you come give a talk? I'm like, sure, what do you want? Talk about teeth. And I'm like, I do emergency and critical care. I don't do teeth, so <laughs> we need to think about plan B. So I wish I were a dentist, but I'm not. Um, and every year when I, I've done CHP training twice, and every time they keep on asking me the same, and I'm like, no, still not a dentist. Um, because that's the big thing. And, you know, same thing when you are in your community, you know, you have a patrol dog, you need that dog, right? And so what's going to happen when it's canine break, it's going to need a root canal and so forth, that's money. If the police department has money, that's great, you know, but if they don't, what do we do? And most police departments, the support system is very strong for the dog. But every now and then you'll hear of police departments where the big boss doesn't care too much or as much as we would like it, um, care enough about the dog. So that's another thing that we have to think about. And then, thankfully and unfortunately for me, in the emergency, we didn't see them very often. And I think that's because, again, uh, in Davis, it's not a very urban area. And very unfortunate, but oncology and radiation therapy. So those dogs have a good amount of cancer because they are breeds that are predisposed to cancer. German Shepherd, Malinois, they get older, are prone to many different cancers. And now the issue becomes even worse because at that time, usually the dog is retired. So it is most definitely the handler's dog because they work together every day for 10 years when the dog retires, he's not bringing the dog to the pond. Like the dog is his dog now. And so now, I would say ballpark, if we're talking about treating average cancer patient in veterinary medicine right now, 
nothing is going to be less than $3,000. And so now I'm telling the guy $3,000. You know, and so again, $3,000 is a lot of money for anyone, you know. And so it's hard because we don't have a support system for those guys either. And so in our community, we have to think about this we, ahead of time again. How do we raise money for active working dogs, but also for retired ones? Because I think they deserve the care that they need. Now, whether you want to put them through it is a different discussion. Um, but in theory, it's nice to have that discussion ahead of time. Neurology. Same problem, uh, they are predisposed to degenerative diseases, but sometimes they are also prone to uh, disc herniation in their spine. If you are a 40 kilo German Shepherd and you herniate a disc in your spine, you know, um, ballpark for surgery, we're looking at eight to $12,000, and that's an emergency. And so we have to think about this ahead of time. So let's look at the occupational hazard. Uh, very tragic, you know, when 9-11 happened, uh, I think that we've learned a lot in particular for first responders in terms of protection for ourselves, you know, uh, from these uh, terrorist attacks. What we realized, this was in 2014, that ground zero workers had cancer, 2,500 of them. And it's not just people aging, because this was only, you know, three years later, but it's also because, oh, sorry, a uh, little more than that, 13 years later, um, but it's also because the type of cancer they had were very different than the ones we expect an aging population to get. And it was so bad that they had to have their own a health system, because now we know for a fact that all those toxins they were exposed to were responsible for the cancers they developed afterward. And this was lymphoma, pancreatic cancer, and so forth. And uh, here what they mentioned was there was 163 cancers that were certified for 9-11 related treatment. For the word certified to be used, it really means you really have to be certain that that's what it was. And so we're looking at prostate, thyroid cancer, leukemia, multiple myelomas. <coughs> So the question was for the working dogs, you know, what happened to those guys? Because humans have protective gear on them and dogs would just go in without any protection at that point. And so they did a study at the University of Pennsylvania and thankfully overall they showed that dogs actually did pretty well. There was no real negative consequences from the exposure and thankfully dogs don't seem to appear as susceptible as humans to um, what happened there. And this was true at uh, five years. There's a little bit of different breeds that were present there. And those are most of them quite popular working breeds. Uh, there are some that are a little unusual, but uh, most of them are, are quite common breeds. So really very important again, dog versus humans is very obvious, but different species, different lifespan, and those guys potentially did not show any negative effect uh, response to the, the original attacks, maybe because it is a different species uh, or different responses because the exposure, if anything, was quite comparable, if not worse, because of the lack of protective gear. Now, in terms of care for those animals, we have to think about field versus uh, in clinic care. And so I think that in this crowd, we're looking at field care mostly, right? And so what do you need to have with you to actually provide care? And then I would say it depends what your job is, right? Because if you are a patrol officer, definitely you're gonna wanna think about how do I treat a massive hemorrhage? How do I stabilize a fracture? What if my dog gets shot or gets stabbed? What if my dog ingests a high dose of narcotic, okay? Versus if we're talking about people responding to natural disasters, um, how am I going to provide eye care? How am I going to provide, you know, uh, rehydration and so forth? So I would say the kit has to be tailored to your needs in a, in a way, and definitely reach out to your local veterinarians to help you build those because they'll be able to give you what you need based on what your job is. Have a checklist with you. This way you know 
what you need to have, uh, and then that checklist can be propagated to different teams so that everybody has the same gear, because it's great to have something, but if any, everyone has something different, that can be a problem as well as you can imagine. And I've, I've touched on this, it's very important to consider a special bond between the animal and its human, okay? And so when we approach working dogs, whether law enforcement or search and rescue, but in a way as well in terms of disasters, you know, if you have a service dog for someone who is blind or deaf, or if it's a dog that senses seizures or diabetic crisis and so forth, this dog has a very important job and the bond with the, the attached human is usually pretty strong. So that's something that you have to think of when you're approaching that dog. And we're all carrying humans, but I think we should go the extra mile with those uh, animals because again, they are buddies. This is stolen from the internet. Uh, this is Dexter, is from the Davis Police Department. And uh, I put this picture there because Dexter is the first dog I met that was this friendly on the police side. And, you know, Dexter goes to schools and farmer's market is off leash, no muzzle, and just goes around and says hi to people. Uh, but when, he, when the boss says that we're going to work, he will bite you because <laughs> uh, that's his job, you know. Uh, and you have to consider that as well in the equation. The team effect, I've mentioned this before about this canine that never was alone in our hospital, pretty much. This is also stolen from the internet in the news. This is a canine that's retired uh, and uh, has a terminal disease going in for euthanasia. And you can see that this is not just the handler grabbing his dog on a Saturday morning and going in his car and going to the vet, you know. Post department shows up and they're saying goodbye to a partner. They're not saying goodbye to a dog. Another even sadder example, <laughs> but you know, I think it's important to know that those are out there. Uh, this is Bretagne, this is a dog that was a social and rescue dog during 9-11. She was the last surviving canine and she had to be put down as well. And as you can see, it's a team thing. They are losing a team member. And I think that we would all agree that this dog has done great things for uh, the nation. The, um, Canine handler uh, bond, again, is very, very important. And I have this picture here because um, just to remind me of just a, an example of how dogs can actually transcend human uh, disagreements. So uh, unfortunately, France uh, has also been victim uh, to many terrorist attacks. And the, kind of the first one of the most recent ones, um, this is Diesel. So the um, Paris, so France is a little bit obviously different than the US. Uh, the way um, ter terrorist response work, we have one team in Paris and that takes care of Paris and the bigger region. And then outside of that, uh, it's the military that takes care of it. So uh, Diesel was one of the team's dog, which is, I'm sorry, I keep on doing that. Diesel was, uh, one of the team's dog, and uh, when the suspects were cornered, she was sent in to clear the room and she never came out. She was the only casualty that day on the good guy's side, the only one. And this was a, a big loss, she had the uh, national honors, and it got to a point where the Russians uh, offered that team their new canine. Um, this happened a few years ago, I think it wouldn't happen again now. It's a little complicated relationship with Russia at the moment. Uh, but just to give you an idea of how uh, a national incident actually was somehow international, uh, because again, everyone was thinking that she was in the news. She was the only casualty that day. This is a picture of Charlie. Charlie is um, the bomb dog uh, from UC Davis Police Department. A very, very cool kid. Um, and, you know, the difference, if you were to care for those two dogs, you know, uh, Charlie guarantee will never bite you. Uh, he's just as likely to bite you as your pet dog because, you know, if they're painful and so forth, but that's not his job. A dog like this, uh, they are trained to bite. And so you have to think about it when you approach them. And <clears throat> when you approach patient, and this is something that 
um, when I teach veterinary students, I always emphasize. And so what I tell them is, I literally tell them, never ever approach a working dog with your face, never ever get down to their eye levels. Obviously, I show up and I'm doing this with Dexter, <laughs> which is fine because he's a great dog. Um, but one example, one day I had a student um, go in and she goes in and puts the eye level right in front of her face and puts the muzzle on the dog. And then the handler says, well, I'm surprised he let you do that. <laughs> Uh, well, this is wrong for two reasons. The first one, the student put herself at risk by doing that. And the second one is the handler was not very intelligent about it either because I feel like if you know your dog is of concern, you should always be proactive about it. So the way I approach working dog and I treat everyone the same, uh, I usually just ask the handler, can you please put the muzzle on? Um, this way we know that that's taken care of. And um, it's a bit different if it's a patrol dog. So always ask the handler, what is your dog's job? If the dog's job is to smell apples at SFO, chances are you're pretty good. Uh, if it's a patrol dog, it's a different deal. So always involve the, the handlers um, in, um, in the process. Working dogs, if they are patrol dogs, just because they are muzzled, does not mean that they are not a potential risk. Many of those dogs are trained to take suspects down, even with the muzzle on. Another example, when I was in vet school, one of my buddy was a um, parachute commando for the French army, and he had a dog, and they would jump out of planes and so forth. And so he, um, and I know the guy and the dog, and he trained with his buddy, and one day he landed his dog, and deployed the dog to his buddy who was wearing the Michelin Man uh, suits. It's a very well padded suit. He deployed the dog with the muzzle on. The dog was running fast enough that he hit the guy and broke his femur just with the impact, okay? And so the guy brings his dog and handlers know their dogs more than anyone. And I was in the room and the teacher, very experienced vet, um, not realizing that handlers have great knowledge of dog's behavior, asked the guy, can you put the dog on the table? And the handler said, no, I can't do that. Because he knows that in this setting, he cannot lift his dog. And the guy insisted, and they put the dog on the table. Five seconds later, the teacher is on the floor, everything in the room is flipped upside down because the dog and the guy was like, well, I told you, that was a no. When I was at the University of Pennsylvania, um, when you were on certain rotation every Friday, you were blessed with the opportunity to take care of the FBI dogs. And that's complete irony because it was a disaster. And I remember I had this guy come with his dog and he was a huge German Shepherd. And the guy just told me, uh, we need a female to take care of my dog. I said, okay, let me find this. <laughs> because again, the guy knows that the only way his dog is getting a shot is if there is a female involved. And it was so bad that the guy went, so I brought the nurses and the guy handed the leash and said, I have to wait outside because he also, for some reason, knew that his dog does not do well when he's, not, when he's there for medical care. It's very specific, right? But the guy knows his dog. And the nurses told me it was just as if they were vaccinating your family Labrador, it was just perfectly fine, okay? Um, so you just have to really rely on the handler. Issues arise if for some reason the handler is incapacitated. Then it becomes very tricky. And so usually I would say the goal is really to secure what's around the animal and then hope for the best. Um, recently I was giving this lecture and one of the handlers told me that one of the tricks they have is that and this, maybe Louise can weigh into that. Uh, usually they have a sleeve in their, in their car. If you put the sleeve on, the dog will latch onto it and nothing else. And you can just pretty much drag the dog back to the car and just push it in and close the car and hope for the best. So that's, I wouldn't recommend doing it, but it's out there. So is that something yeah. that, yeah. So, for yeah, for a patrol dog, obviously, if it's or a, it's yeah, or yeah, because they like, they like their toys. Uh, obviously, if it's a, anything but a patrol dog, 
chances are you're fine, it's just a dog. But keep in mind that sometimes they are dual purpose dog as well. So that was my speech about this. Uh, and the special considerations we have as well, you know, in those animals is that uh, not only um, taking care of a very special dogs that has a relationship with uh, a human, but those dogs have a job, okay? And so you have to discuss goals with them. Uh, one day I was talking to CHP and they were quite unhappy about the care they got at a practice regarding dental health because the people at the dental clinic were talking about aesthetics when it comes to the dental work. And the guys were like, all I care about is that my dog has teeth to bite. I don't care about how they look, uh, they have to be functional, okay? Um, the other thing too is when we talk about gastric dilation volvulus or bloat, it's a big, big issue in working dogs. It's a, an issue with their stomach, where the stomach rotates. Um, we have to think about ways to prevent it because if we let it happen, the mortality rate is very high and even if we don't, pass away from it, it takes weeks to recover from that. And so it means that for weeks, the handler has no canine. And if you are in a unit that heavily relies on a single dog and that dog is out, now you have a gap in your law enforcement capabilities at that point. And there's very, very, very little research, unfortunately, in terms of why do dogs smell while we think they smell? We know that dogs can smell for shell case, they can smell for food, they can smell for cell phone in prisons apparently, uh, but we actually don't know why, how, and when we give those animals medications, we don't know what the effect of those medications are. And so there's some discussions out there that potentially giving a dog steroids or doxycycline can actually be a problem. And so what if I'm treating the dog that is going to sweep the stadium in Sacramento where the president is going to give a, a speech and somehow my medication now suppress that dog's ability to smell? That's a big problem. And so I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research that can be done. What if you have an abduction and the dog is supposed to track a kidnapped kid and somehow the dog got a medication that day that compromised its smelling abilities and we don't even know about it. And so that's a huge gap that to me seems like we have to fill it, but uh, there's not much research being done in that area. And uh, we're wrapping up here. This was um, another story of why I'm doing what I'm trying to do here. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, I'm sharing you guys with sad stories, but I think it's important. Um, and this story was happy for a long time. Um, this is canine Pedro, and uh, he was struck by a car after chasing a um, suspect. And when he was struck, he had a bad injury to his chest and a fractured spine. And the handlers uh, actually attended one of Cover Your Canine uh, Tactical Rescue, and uh, they provided care for the dog on site. But they need to move the patient. And so they called for uh, evacuation. And so the firefighters got a call saying, officer down. And while there's a lot of rivality uh, between firefighters and police, it's quite funny to listen to them talk about each other, uh, they also watch out for each other very carefully. And so they just, you know, dropped their barbecue and drove straight to the, um, to the site and they got there and it was a dog. And they were dumbfound uh, because they were like, wow, we've never done this before. And so thankfully the, the handlers had quite advanced training and uh, Pedro was evacuated perfectly to UC Davis and uh, had surgery and actually had full recovery and passed away for unexpected things months later. Uh, so it was a positive thing in the sense that he did not pass away from that injury, but unfortunately he passed away afterward. But he got to retire at home and uh, <laughs> this is Officer Barrera and he got another canine and he was telling me that he was quite happy because he has a new dog and when he was gone, he knew his family was very safe because they had a cop at home 24 <laughs> seven. Um, so even though bad things happened to Pedro afterward, um, he still had a positive outcome from the injury. 
the reason why, then this is him a few months later uh, at the California State Fair, and you can see he's fully ambulatory and doing just fine and just representing uh, what we were doing. And this is Charlie, his uh, sidekick here. And from this incident, I got a call from um, Woodland uh, Fire Department, and they were like, okay, we need training because this happened with Pedro and we feel like we could have done better. And so I was like, okay, fine, I'll be there. And usually what I would say is that anyone who provides care as a first responder is able to provide the same care to a dog. In my experience, all I had to do is to tell people, whatever you think you do for a human, do it for the dog, okay? The only difference is talking about what the dog's job is, knowing, involving the handler if at all possible and so forth, but beyond that, everything's about the same concept. You may, the way you do it might be different. You don't give oxygen the same way you would give oxygen, you don't put on a backboard the same way, but the idea is the same. And I think usually it's fair to say that anyone involved in incidents like this uh, is very creative and can make things happen. So since, I'm very happy because I got to meet great people, so a few examples. So this was in uh, Woodland, this was Vacaville, I've done CHP, Solano County Sheriff, another CHP here, um, and I'm here today, so I'm very excited that more and more people uh, are doing this. Uh, and obviously I'm not the only one, there are great associations like Cover Your Canine who do it, and other groups that do the same nationally as well, and also internationally, but I think it's all about awareness. I think that's what I have for you guys today. Uh, no, because I think the next one is, sorry? Uh, I think the next presentation we'll use during the training later. So if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, yes. That's a great question, and there are some efforts to actually think about collaborations with pet insurance for working dogs, because raising money for working dogs is, I don't want to say easy, because Louise is here, and she does a lot of it, and it's not easy, but if there's one cause, people will donate money readily, it's working dogs. And so for pet insurance to be able to say, we insure, those dogs, people would love those companies. So there is some discussion to actually not only do fundraising to pay for the bills, but also ahead of time for insurance. Yeah. And also defining what the insurance covers. Because just like in humans, uh, in animals, just because a pet is insured doesn't mean it's insured for everything. And so I've had some unfortunate situations where people thought, that, oh, I have pet insurance, but it only covers vaccines, which are not very expensive to begin with, so. And there's also um, things like Fair Credit, where I mm -hmm. my handler is on the phone, and they called and got the line of credit from Fair Credit, and then that, for example, like David, it's like an 18 month period. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah, and many hospitals will take care credit. The problem you know. is, like, who can know all the debts, mm. you know? And it's never good to do it at 2 a.m. on a Sunday night is the problem. Although I've got one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'll give this to the guy who's asking the question. Oh, okay, got you. I have to give this to you, sorry. Oh, can I repeat the question? Um, I was just reflecting on the story you we were talking about uh, when dispatch called or got the call that an officer was injured. I, did they think post that event that, that maybe including the fact that a police officer is down, that officer is a canine, including that information for any equipment that might be specialized for a canine or something, something outside of the realm that might be more useful to have on the rig? 
Yeah, I think that that would be a great thing to do. And maybe the story was uh, aggravated to me, you know, or maybe it was mentioned but not relayed, you know, because as we know, things happen uh, along the line of uh, communication. For sure, the more you communicate about an incident, the better, because if over the phone you get a call saying that an officer, like a canine officer, was shot, that's very different than a canine officer who was struck by a car, for instance. You expect something different. So I think it really emphasized the importance of clear communication, which unfortunately is not always present. But yeah. Very good. Mm. And I guess uh, to that respect as well, um, sometimes mentioning that it's an animal that's involved may also mean that a, a special team with special resources might be sent. Uh, and obviously, you know, if different if it's a horse or, or uh, a dog, obviously. And so um, Jim Green in the UK, which many, if not all of you know, uh, has done a tremendous amount of work with animal rescue and what he's done in, 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 in the rescue side is you know, phenomenal and definitely has developed special response units that will actually have a specific skill set but also specific uh, devices and so forth that are readily deployed. All right, I think I'll just wrap it up then. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell Julie to uh, reopen the doors for you guys. <laughs> oh. <laughs>